It's a bit like asking a poor mother whether she should uh, not bother about her children's education because feeding her children is more important. Certainly there are contexts in which the first priority may be to save lives and not conservation. But in most of our contexts, war and poverty and ecological degradation go hand in hand. Poverty leads to ecological degradation, but ecological disasters also affect the poor disproportionately and are often the causes of conflict within countries and between countries. So we have to deal with all of them together. The rural poor depend directly on the natural resource base. This is where the pharmacy is, this is where the local supermarket is. This is, in fact, their fuel station. It is their power company, it is their water company. What would happen to you if these things were removed from your local neighborhood? And this is really what happens to the rural poor when environmental degradation takes place. And therefore, we really cannot afford not to invest in environmental conservation because this is how we enhance the ability of the rural poor to have an option. This is how we provide for them ways of getting out of their poverty trap and generate even the utilities that they need for their own daily livelihoods. <laughs> As a biologist, I know that the environmental crisis is really serious. I see things changing all around that are unnatural. The birds are coming to the UK in spring a week early, and the flowers at places like the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew are flowering a week earlier. And you see this phenomenon worldwide. There is a huge extinction of amphibias and frogs. I visited Costa Rica one time and loved this little golden toad. The next time I was there, it was extinct. And that was due to a dry climate in the summer. I've been to many places in the world, and wherever I go, people talk about exceptional climate happenings, droughts or floods or freak storms, and those are exactly the things that the climate change modelers uh, have predicted. And then I go to places like the Andes and they talk about receding glaciers, and I read in the literature that this is happening in the Alps in the same way. Plants are beginning to colonize areas of the Arctic that they never did before. The polar bears are threatened by the breaking up of the ice there, and the penguins are threatened by huge uh, iceberg that has broken off from Antarctica. So from the Arctic to Antarctic, from uh, Europe to Asia, there are these things that really convince a biologist or a physical scientist that there is something drastically wrong with our world today. The world is certainly facing um, the worst environmental crisis that there ever has been. All the data show a major um, uh, reduction in um, uh, biodiversity, species extinctions at a rate that's completely unparalleled. We have 12% uh, of birds, 23% uh, of mammals, 32% of amphibians threatened with extinction. The um, data show that these trends are getting worse, not better. We have climate changing more rapidly than at any other time before. We have increased pollution, especially increased nitrogen deposition around the world. We're moving into a phase that's completely uncharted territory as far as the future is concerned. And the future impacts that this could have on human life are very uncertain, but it's an experiment that we should never have been uh, uh, conducting in the first place. The misconception is that we always uh, read the Bible as just a collection of isolated texts and we don't read the Bible from beginning to end as one story that leads from creation to the new creation. And the new creation is the old creation renewed, restored, transformed so that every part of this creation is now filled with the presence of God. And that's the goal towards which God is taking human history. 
So he calls us as his redeemed people to live today as if the future is already present, to live as signs of that future kingdom, which is the restoration of all things. And because that restoration includes the non-human creation as well as the human creation, our care for the non-human creation is a sign of God's coming kingdom. And in that way, we are witnessing to the Lord of all creation. Arosha makes a significant difference to the conservation movement because it is Christians who are practicing conservation. And as Arosha now operates in many countries, it is wonderful to see that uh, there are Christians that have had the vision of Arosha to do something about the environment. They are doing it because they believe there is a creator and that they should do something and combine their faith with positive action. That's what our Russia is all about. I have known the work of our Russia almost since its beginning, admired it greatly, and uh, it's in many ways my favorite charity because I see the sort of results that are happening, change happening in a small way in each of the different places where our Russia works. I'm particularly excited to see that it's beginning to take off in some of the uh, developing world, places like Ghana, Brazil, Peru, because those countries really need that. And there's not much tradition of scientists and Christians working together uh, for environmental problems. And our Russia is giving this opportunity for scientists who are Christians to do something very positive for the environment. I think it's very important that we have a Christian environmental organization because Christians bring something very distinctive to the conservation movement that otherwise wouldn't be there. Christian theology is, is based on the premise that Jesus Christ reconciles all of creation, all of nature, everything that has been made, that he reconciles things to God and so that human beings cooperating with Christ can be agents in the restoration of nature, of the nature that we humans have messed up. So it's an enormous hopeful message that Christians bring to what is otherwise a very bleak and desperate environmental situation.